Sometimes the traditional eclectic type action categories um, are not adequate. And a really good example of the, that limitation is, is sage. Um, salvia officinalis. And by the way, the binomial um, suffix um, officinalis means the plant was an official medicine. It was used, it was available in official pharmacy stores in the old days. Now, sage is uh, an antimicrobial. It's an astringent. Um, it's got a bunch of those sorts of properties it's used in cooking, which actually is an important point we'll come back to. Any herb that's used as a flavor in cooking, um, you can assume a fair degree of safety and lack of toxicity. And that's a relevant point to what I'm going to say. It's recently, recently, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, researchers in Europe and actually also Iran. Iran has become a center for um, good quality, real herbal research with real people, as opposed to lab animals. I, I heard this line recently, some of the NIH, NIH researchers who, who look for active constituents in plants. I've forgotten the man's name, but he said, if we ever came across um, mice in the wild with, in, with cancer, we'd know exactly how to cure them. You know, that doesn't mean you can cure humans, but still. Turns out that sage as a genus, the salvia genus, has got some profound um, central nervous system properties as, as the genus, which don't fit into nervine as such. If you read Gerard, um, Parkinson, um, in fact, all the way up to um, Culpeper, but after Culpeper, this stops being said, sage was seen as something that was used for um, the pattern of memory loss of old age, which if we reinterpret that, it would be seen as this is a potential treatment for Alzheimer's. Um, now, when I was first studying and saw the claims for sage from the old books and peppermint from the old books, um, I tried them and they didn't do anything. But this was me, the uh, hippie young herbalist, who thought that nervine claims if it was a good nervine, it meant that it was like cannabis or stronger. Completely got it wrong. I, I really messed that one up. And until very recently, totally ignored, ignored sage when it came to the central nervous system. Um, it's now been shown very clearly in animals and humans, um, healthy humans and then clinically ill people, that um, sage can work as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It can um, inhibit the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, which leads to short-term memory loss in forms of dementia. So it's clear that ordinary garden sage drunk as a tea, and which is interesting, they did the research on the tea, not on the tincture. Um, clear clinical findings to show that it, it is an equivalent potential medis medicine to tacrine, hupazine, some of the new prescription drugs, drugs new to Western medicine, um, for controlling early stage dementia. There's, none of them are cures for Alzheimer's. What they are are substances which slow down some of the discomforting symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, this is in most people's gardens. This is widely available. It's free. There's no toxicity. There's no toxicity because we've evolved with it. We've been using sage and cooking forever. Um, it does contain very, very, very low levels of uh, thujone, which has got some theoretical problems. So the new treatment protocols coming out of sage research are actually moving towards what's called um, Spanish sage, it's another species, um, and I can't remember the actual species. You're, you're going to have to look that one up. But it is very much like this, but it doesn't have Thuja. Um, there are other sages uh, which are relaxing, other sages which are stimulating. There's one sage 
which is a very powerful psychedelic, um, Salvia Divinorum, the, the diviner sage, which actually breaks all the rules of neuropharmacology. Um, constituents and synthetics which um, work in the brain and change consciousness, almost all of them are based on a nitrogen containing molecule. All of the psychedelics, and nobody really knows how they work, they know what the pathway is, but what that final thing is, nobody knows. They're all nitrogen containing molecules um, for some very clear reasons. The salvanorin in Salvia divinorum, named after the species name, is a diterpene. It has no nitrogen in it. It's not an alkaloid. It shouldn't have any effects at all. The closest um, central nervous system effects. Um, the sweet tasting constituent in stevia is closely structurally related to um, um, salvanorin. So why does salvanorin work? It's, it's raising all these new questions, but it's a sage, a psychedelic sage, which is, is pretty surreal. There are Turkish species which traditionally were used in the control of, um, of epilepsy. So this is a really intriguing genus that doesn't have major traditional nervine effects. What it has is very specific pharmacological central nervous system effects. And it's a place where, where the new science really does augment the traditional knowledge. So um, this is usually used as a carminative. It's used topically as an antimicrobial. Um, there are varieties of salvia officinalis um, which are used for uh, rapidly alleviating the pain of, of canker sores, of aphthous ulcers. Um, there's red sage and purple sage, which are varieties of this. Um, they don't look red. They don't look purple. There's a, it's a darker green. It's botanist being created. Um, anybody with a canker sore, if they, if they don't have those, if they just get ordinary sage, you know, just from Safeway, just from any supermarket, make a... Um, a medium strength tea with it and use it as a mouthwash, the pain will go very rapidly and do it regularly over a few days that the, the canker sores go away. Now on paper, the chemistry of the oils in, in sage, it should be an irritant. And on paper, chamomile with its much gentler oils should be the one that works. But in practice, it's sage that works, which is a good example of not building your protocol development on the chemistry. It's the experience. This is culinary sage or kitchen sage, Salvia officinalis. There are many, many, many kinds of sages, and a lot of them are interchangeable in their usage. If they're salvias, they aren't interchangeable with the other set of sages, the Artemisias. And it's used in cooking to cut down on fat, like a fatty uh, dish, uh, like um, goose, which is very fatty, it would be used uh, um, to help with the digestion of fats and oils. And um, it uh, does help. I've used it for gallbladder colic. And then it helps release um, more bile, which moistens the bowel and the stool and can get rid of um, constipation at times, or it can um, just help generally with um, the digestion and the, particularly the assimilation of fats and oils because of the improved bilious bile flow. And it not only helps fats and oils on a deeper level um, or digest, but it goes deeper into, it, uh, into the body to help the body process and use fats and oils. So it's good for the skin it's even good for the mucosa. It's good for lichenification of the skin, which is, in fact, it looks kind of like a, s a little lumpy, like a sage leaf. Um, there's sort of a little lichen-like fine wrinkling up. I've seen this particularly with menopausal women around the neck for some reason. Also, postmenopausal women with um, lichenification of the mouth, which is where the um, 
saliva glands are involved and you lose your sense of taste. And this remedy is, then helps distribute the, the fats and oils to the skin again. Plumps up the skin. I think uh, one of the German uh, aromatherapists, Dietrich Gumbel, said that nothing was more mm, kind of increase the youth of the skin or restored the youth of the skin than sage. It's excellent for um, that menopausal transition where, a, where we're male and female, where we're tr um, transferring from uh, ovarian or testicular production of hormones to adrenal production in the back, in the adrenals above the kidneys because we need all our hormones for regular life maintenance as well as for reproduction so we need them after menopause and this very important usage I learned from Phyllis Light. A lot of women wear and men too wear themselves out with kind of a hyperadrenalinism when they're young and they're always out living on the edge and excitement and fight or flight kind of um, in coffee um, just in their work uh, living from deadline to deadline or whatnot and then they hit um, menopause and they burn out because their adrenals they wasted their adrenals they they were they were living off their adrenaline rushes and that takes a lot out of the adrenal cortex the fat of the kidneys and that fat shrivels up and um, then when we hit menopause and we need to make our hormones in the back there it's there's nothing left to do it so then you start shriveling up and wrinkling more and aging quickly and while you don't really see menopause in men that often what you'd see is a, a phenomenon that Michael Moore commented on the, the herbalist Michael Moore that um, you will see some men and one day they look robust and fine and the next day they're just shriveled up and old because they don't have that they couldn't produce their their hormones through the uh, adrenal cortex. This is the remedy for that. Strengthens the adrenal cortex and helps us through that transition change of life. It's pretty good for hot flashes with night sweats. It was well known for that. It was actually used for tuberculosis to the sweating, uncontrollable sweating. Um, it's not my all-time favorite hot flash remedy. That would be blue vervain. Really good. And um, generally, it is for more mellow people than blue vervain. Blue vervain is for really intense ramrod straight people. And um, this remedy, I uh -huh, almost got him. <laughs> this remedy is for a more mellow type of person. Okay, not only does it act on the fats, but it acts on the blood. It thins the blood, and it acts on the coagulating factors, and it will get rid of coagulated blood like an old wound or black and blue mark that's swollen where there's a ridge of uh, congested, co congealed blood there. And that use comes from Chinese medicine, but I've used it that way, and I've seen that use from Western herbalists too, though it's not as well known. It will get rid of... Um, that kind of blood uh, over coagulation of the blood and um, thickening of the blood and that'll prevent strokes so again that's aging it's really a great remedy for elders elder care it's for sage sages makes a sage out of us <laughs> uh -huh. here we are in the culinary garden in the culinary garden there are many plants that we use in the kitchen for flavoring and to bring nice recipes to our, our table. But many of these plants can be used as medicines. Um, many people have sage, rosemary, parsley, thyme, basil in their culinary gardens or actually even in their spice cabinet. Uh, this plant, sage or salvia officinalis, uh, is one of the plants that one might be able to find in their kitchen to use if a child is not well. So we make it a very nice strong tea out of it as a gargle for sore throats or uh, laryngitis, loss of voice. <clears throat> Sage can be used 
and uh, any type of fever, so it could be added to the fever tea that I talked to about. But generally, this is a very pungent herb. It's very strong, and it has a strong taste, and most young children won't like it because of its strong t taste. Older children are more apt to tolerate it. So generally, I don't use it in most teas because it will overpower the tea. If I need to make a gargle with it, I will mix it, a tea of sage with lemon and honey or lemon and maple syrup, and use that as a gargle for the child. Otherwise, sage can be used externally, topically for funguses, such as athlete's foot. You can make a tea from it, or you can actually use an extract or sage oil mixed with some um, oils like body oil, such as olive oil or almond oil, and put on the fungus itself. It can also be used as a mouthwash for thrush, which many children get thrush, so you can actually take the tea and saturate a cotton swab and swab it around the mouth on the thrush uh, lesions itself.